Yellowstone supervolcano, a lot of activity recorded near the caldera, and people felt it. This is according to USGS explanations by Jacob Blowenstein. We know that the caldera is underneath Yellowstone Lake, which is a huge lake. It's a, the supervolcano, as we know, is at the border of uh, northwest Wyoming. It borders with Montana and Idaho. Kalamori reports on, on Express UK having to do with explanations given by Yellowstone Volcano Observatory of the USGS. Scientists at USGS recorded a lot of earthquake activity in the area surrounding the caldera. It was revealed during a lecture on the supervolcano by Jacob Lowenstein. Yellowstone Volcano, sitting between the U.S. states of Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho, inside the Yellowstone National Park. The caldera is labeled a supervolcano because it has the capacity to inflict disaster on a worldwide scale if another super eruption occurs. There have been at least uh, this kind three that have taken place in the past two million years, 2.1 million years ago, 1.3 million years ago, and 630 years ago were there super eruptions, and another serious eruption took place 70,000 years ago, which make, apparently makes the eruptions now overdue. Since that serious eruption of 70,000 years ago, we had 80 eruptions since then. Now, in December 2008, Continuing into January 2009, more than 500 earthquakes were detected under the northwest end of Yellowstone Lake. That's basically where West Summer Lake is, and it's close to the new thermal area that they have discovered. But anyway, going back to this, 500 earthquakes detected under the northwest end of Yellowstone Lake over a seven-day period, 500 quakes in a week with the largest registering at a 3.9 magnitude Richter. Jacob Lowenstein, who is in charge of monitoring Yellowstone for USGS, explained that a seismograph of the amount of activity on just one day, December 27, 2008, he told students during the lecture at Menlo Park, California in 2014, these are seismograms, and they are from the south and north end of the lake. The grams are the actual paper uh, indications, as we see here. The seismograph, or the seismometer, is the actual mechanism that records it. So there were a lot of earthquakes, a lot of earthquake activity in Yellowstone, 500 earthquakes in one week. He said, you have the time starting from early or top to bottom, and each 15 minutes is represented by the black line. So four would be an hour. And these are all earthquakes. Every time you get a squiggle, you're looking at an earthquake. Lowestein went on to reveal how although the earthquakes were not particularly strong, they were still felt in the park. And he added, in this particular day, there was a lot of activity. The biggest one was a magnitude 4. There were also ones 2s and 3s, a number of felt earthquakes. It was in December, though, so there weren't a lot of people around. He's meaning uh, tourists, tourist-wise, uh, which is usually in the summer that they go for their vacations, for example. And he goes on to say, but there were maybe 15 or 20 people who were living near the lake at the time, and they felt it. It happened for about two weeks, and the earthquakes were on a lineal trend. Dr. Lowenstein revealed how USGS were left on edge six years earlier, thanks to the Denali earthquake that occurred in Alaska. Now, that was a very huge quake. If you look at Google Earth, you see that it's uh, very the Denali wilderness uh, areas around Mount McKinley, and it's about... Well, it's over just over 2,000 miles from Yellowstone, quite a ways away. Now, Dr. Lowenstein revealed how USGS were left on edge six years earlier, thanks to the Denali earthquake that occurred in Alaska. 
He said, the Denali earthquake occurred in 2002, and it was a magnitude 7.9 that occurred on the Denali Fault up in Alaska. Anytime you have an earthquake, especially on a strip strike slip fault, you'll get surface waves produce. Those are the ones that do a lot of damage to buildings, the strike slip fault. And in the case of this particular earthquake, it sent big surface waves out in a southeasterly direction. He went on to explain, now, even one of these little diamonds here represents a seismic station. Lowenstein went on to explain how seismometers near Yellowstone failed to record the impact. He added, the ones that are red are pegged out. They're clipped data because the surface waves that were coming from that earthquake were so big, even down in Montana and Wyoming, that the seismometers could not record the data. There was too much shaking, and so it's what we call clipped. Whereas the blue stations, where there was a little bit less ground surface wave movement down into California, for example, these are figures from a paper by the University of Utah. Stephen Husen was the man, the main author. Now, I don't understand how it's possible that a seismometer cannot uh, record the quakes, because a seismometer is able to record the quakes uh, at least of a size of a magnitude 9.5 Richter, which is uh, the biggest, basically, the biggest earthquake ever recorded was a 9.5 Richter. I don't know if it's possible for earthquakes to be bigger than I assume they can be, um, especially when you have a cataclysm or a deluge or something, or an asteroid impact, God forbid. But um, we see that there is evidence that, obviously, when you have a large earthquake in one part of the world, as they have taught us, it ripples it has a ripple effect going all the way to thousands of miles away. It could even reach the other side of the earth. So we were given the explanation that they did not record the quake in Yellowstone because their seismometers clipped. This is not the first time this has happened. This also happens in another area which is very dangerous for huge earthquakes the Anatolia Fault in Turkey, and uh, we know that these areas uh, also the subduction zone of uh, Western United States, of course, besides uh, Alaska, uh, that they can have uh, a supersonic type of a sound. Uh, you hear a boom before the big earthquake. It gives you a couple of seconds to take cover before the huge earthquake starts. Uh, we're talking about big ones, right? Uh, like a 7.5 and above. Um, something that they're expecting uh, in, uh, in their, and they're warning people concerning uh, Southern California around Los Angeles. But we had clipping of the seismometers in recently in Turkey and uh, the Kandili Observatory Earthquake Research Institute says that that happened to their seismometers as well. And this is what they explain. Any measurement system's dynamic range in decibels, dB, can be defined as proportion of maximum minimum amplitude, which can be measured by the system. A dy dynamic range defines the limitation of the system. Maximum dynamic range caused by an earthquake with magnitude around 9 is known approximately 220 decibels in the world, although the analog feedback brought back seismic sensors have a 160 decibel dynamic range seems to be enough to record most of the earthquakes. These sensors may clip, or there is a saturation, when the ground shaking caused by seismic waves is strong enough. Many institutions use broadband seismometers in Turkey. Because of the clipping of the broadband seismometers, there were some problems on location and magnitude of the Van earthquake, which occurred October 23, 2011. To avoid the clipping problem, propose that relevant sensors choose to install or install acceler accelerometer simultaneously with a broadband sensor to the recording system at the seismic stations. In this study, given information of why the broadband sensor is clipping, clearing up the general and wrong understanding is broadband seismometers should not clip. So that's maybe one of the reasons why 
Yellowstone seismometers or seismograms were not able, seismo, yeah, the seismograms were not able to uh, record the Denali earthquake because of the fact that the, the shaking was so strong. Uh, I had thought that most uh, seismometers were able to record up to a 9.5. I guess that's not always possible. So hopefully they'll be able to collect uh, to correct this problem so that from the future, for the future, they'll be able to properly monitor earthquakes that are large enough. And perhaps they should also install the accelerometer simultaneously with their sensors. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.